This is Duke University. Everyone, uh, I think we're going to get started. Um, thanks for coming. I'm Lilia with the Human Rights Law Society. Uh, we're sponsoring this event today. Uh, we're very excited to have two fantastic experts um, with us to have a conversation about um, the nexus between the internet and digital technologies and human rights. Uh, so first, we'll hear from Rebecca McKinnon, who is the author of the new book, Consent of the Networked, The Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom. Uh, Rebecca is a Bernard L. Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation in Washington, where she conducts research writing and advocacy on global internet policy, free expression, and the impact of digital technologies on human rights. She is the co-founder of Global Voices, an international citizen net media network. Um, fluent in Mandarin, Rebecca was formerly a journalist for CNN in China and Japan. And then uh, next we'll hear from our own esteemed Professor James Boyle. Uh, he's a leading voice on intellectual property law and the open access movement. As many of you probably know, he's the co-founder of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain here at Duke Law, and was also a founding director of Creative Commons, a nonprofit organization that provides licenses uh, that lets individual artists choose how to share their work freely. Um, and his latest book is The Public Domain, Enclosing the Commons of the Mind, Shamans, Software, and Spleens, uh, Law and Construction of the Information Society. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Quite a long title. Um, and following their presentations, we'll have some, uh, some time for Q&A as well. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rebecca. Thanks again. Thanks very much. Is my mic working? Can't tell. Hopefully it is. So uh, I had the fortune, I guess, of writing this book in the middle of the Arab Spring. And so I had to keep rewriting it as I was writing it as, as events unfolded. Um, but there's been a lot of hype uh, in the media and elsewhere on the role that the internet played in bringing down a couple of governments in, in the Middle East and North Africa, Egypt and Tunisia. Um, Libya doesn't count because that was a military thing. I don't think we can say the internet brought, brought that government down. Um, and also the internet's role in, in helping people organize and challenge the authority of governments around that region. But there's a bigger question of the extent to which the internet is going to enable people in Tunisia, Egypt, and elsewhere to build robust and stable democracies coming out of their re revolutions. That's much less clear. And to, to give an example of some of the challenges that, that people are facing, um, this is a photograph taken by an activist who stormed into the state security headquarters outside of Cairo a couple months after um, Hosni Mubarak stepped down. And this is another photograph taken by another activist. And this was actually posted in real time. And it was, it was really amazing, actually, one Saturday afternoon um, last year as I was procrastinating and following Twitter, I started to see all my Egyptian Twitter followers retweeting tweets from people who were going through the state security headquarters and like, you know, somebody was tweeting, oh, I just found the room where I was interrogated a year ago, and you know, this kind of thing, really intense. And the, the agents left behind a lot of documents that had been shredded that they obviously didn't want the public to know about. But there were a lot of doc documents that were left intact. And some people found their files, or they found the files of other people they knew. And lo and behold, full of reams and reams of transcripts of their email exchanges and their cell phone text message exchanges and the locations of their cell phones being tracked by the cell towers and their Skype chat conversations they thought had been secure, but it turns out were not. Um, other information that they had transmitted through their um, uh, computers on the internet that had been captured by their internet service provider. And one activist actually found a contract from a British company to the state security for some technology that's known broadly as deep packet inspection technology that would assist the, the authorities there in conducting more finely grained surveillance of activists. And so while a government has fallen, or, or we should say a dictator has fallen, um, Egypt is of course going through a very difficult transition that I won't elaborate on. I'm, hopefully you've read about it in the papers. Um, but uh, civil society is, is very much under pressure. The act activists, a number of activist groups have been facing arrest and, and detention and, and so on. 
and people are realizing that they're, while the internet has been useful in organizing, um, the, the government is watching and that they'd be naive to think that just because Mubarak is out of power that the, the transitional military government is not availing itself of these technologies. And so the question is, as you have in, in a transitional country, when you have a change of regime, an attempt to build in a democracy, what role not only does the constitution and the political structures play, but the technological infrastructure. And when the government that, or when the people who control the networks at the time of transition are able to exercise and perhaps one can say abuse power through those networks, how is that going to affect the ultimate, ultimate political outcomes? And how is that going to affect the ability of people to conduct dissent, um, political organizing, opposition, and so on? And this, this is a question, I think, that um, is ripe for a lot of discussion. Um, in Tunisia, a, another interesting thing that has happened is that Moez Chakchuk, the head of Tunisia's internet agency, has been going around in speeches admitting that under Ben Ali, uh, under the, the rule of Ben Ali, his agency was testing censorship software um, on behalf of foreign companies who then kind of basically were using Tunisia as a beta test ground and then marketed this technology around the region. Um, and so Mr. Chakchuk is has been talking quite a lot about the challenge he faces because he wants his agency and he wants Tunisia's networks to be a neutral platform for the emergence of a new democracy in Tunisia. But the question is how do you ensure that it is in fact a neutral platform and that those who control the, the networks are not abusing their, their ability to censor and manipulate information. And actually there's been a big debate going on in Tunisia all year around whether certain obscene content in an Islamic society should be censored on the web. And this is a screenshot taken by some activists last May, well after Ben Ali stepped down, when the transitional government for a while was censoring some content um, on Facebook and elsewhere um, by blocking it, filtering it. This is the, the block page. Um, eventually, this was challenged. It went all the way to the, the High Court of Tunisia. The High Court of Tunisia ruled against the censorship. But this continues to be a political issue. And actually, a lot of people who were elected to the Constituent Assembly in Tunisia were elected on a pro-censorship platform. Um, not only censorship of the internet, but censorship of television, uh, tradition, traditional media as well, because they were running on a conservative religious platform. And, and that tends to be um, it tends to be fairly pro-censorship um, in a lot of democracies. And so this whole question of what do you do when democratically elected governments, um, uh, legislatures seek to censor and surveil in ways that um, those in opposition um, feel is abusive or excessive. And which highlights this, this the situation really that the world is in right now, um, everywhere that has sufficient internet penetration is that increasingly citizens' relationship with government and their relationship with power structures generally is mediated through the internet. And so how do we ensure that the internet and the mobile devices, you know, sort of the, the networks and platforms and, and, and everything that comprises the internet is acting as a neutral intermediary between us and the government and our economic opportunities and everything else? How do we ensure that this evolves in a way that really favors and empowers the citizens rather than serving as an opaque extension of whoever won the last election and their power? Um, and as we've seen you know, in the United States, we are certainly by no means immune from these questions. And this is the block page, or this is the page, a screenshot of, of Wikipedia on that day in January when Wikipedia went dark to protest the Stop Online Piracy Act, um, which was you know, not an attempt to censor political speech in the United States, uh, but it was members of Congress reacting to uh, constituencies who feel that they are victims of, of piracy online and want a solution, and that solution proposed involved both censorship and effectively surveillance by intermediaries of 
their users' behavior in order to prevent infringing content from appearing. Uh, and so this whole question of once you put those mechanisms in place, can they be abused? And you know, how, how do you hold that abuse accountable? And because one of the reasons, you know, just putting the whole issue of whether our cop copyright law works or what it should be aside, there is this whole issue of how do you, what do you do with censorship and surveillance mechanisms that a democratically elected government puts in place ostensibly for limited purposes and how do you prevent power from being abused through those mechanisms? And we do not have good answers. Um, in fact, we have no answers. Um, of course, in China, you have the ultimate extreme where you have unaccountable government and unaccountable networks, uh, unaccountable businesses sort of converging. Um, this is, of course, the Great Firewall of China. And it's what most people think about when they think about internet censorship in China, the fact that you know, tens, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of website, web pages are blocked um, at the network level. And so this is what happens when you try to access Facebook in China. You get this block page. And this is from a Chrome browser. It'll look a little bit different depending on what browser you're using. But that's effectively what, what it's, it looks like to experience the, the Great Firewall of China. But that's really only the top layer of censorship in China. And actually, most of the censorship in China um, on the Chinese internet, um, on networks and platforms, run by Chinese companies inside China, that censorship and surveillance is being done by the companies themselves. So this is a ceremony that I actually managed to attend. I was sitting way in the back, so I couldn't get a good picture. So I used this website picture. This is a ceremony I managed to attend in 2009, which is called the Internet Self-Discipline Awards. Um, and it's run by the Internet Society of China. And it's an award given out every year to the top 20 organizations and website operators that do the best job of policing their users. And of course, the language used is actually quite familiar. You know, it's, it's because the language they're using is not you know, that you're suppressing your users' uh, free speech and here you did a good job. It's like, we, you know, these, are, these are the internet companies that have done the best job in making the internet safe, uh, in, in preventing abuse, in, in you know, just, just, just creating a responsible, safe internet for, for society. You know, a harmonious internet is another term they like to use a lot. And, and you hear the same kind of language from both kind of certain communities in, in the United States who are advocating more management of the internet as well. And this is just an example of, of how these mechanisms work that the companies put to uh, sort of create within their own platforms. This is an article I tried to post about the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Liu Xiaobo, who, had, who was spending 10 years in jail for his treatise uh, calling for multi-party democracy. And I can't even post this post. Uh, you know, I get an error message saying, we're sorry. You know, the, the content you, you, you posted is tried to post as unacceptable. Please try, try again. And there's ways you know, people use kind of funky language to, to talk about what they're talking about without talking about it and so on to sort of get around these blocks, but then there are kind of human, you know, all these companies have staffs of, you know, the big Chinese internet companies have departments of like 100 people or so who also manually review things for like if their traffic spikes and, you know, is it, it generating a lot of activity, you know, then take it down or uh, um, delete somebody's account or hand over the information about that user to the police and so on. So, uh, the, the point about censorship in China, which uh, I think people, most people have missed, is that it's really intermediary censorship. It's, it's censorship carried out by the private sector because the government is holding the private sector responsible for what's happening on their platforms. And of course, those of you who study kind of issues of intermediary liability will know that trends toward greater intermediary liability are growing worldwide, you know, as, as a way for governments seeking to solve problems that, that, uh, that exist on the internet. Um, now, in my book, I also talk about kind of the shifting of sovereignty, right? And so, you know, in, in, in the pre-internet world, it worked relatively well to have kind of law based on nation states and governance based on nation states and kind of legitimacy and political power sort of organized by nation states um, and so on. Of course, that's being made more complicated by the, the types of kind of communities online that have their own legitimacies and constituencies that span 
across borders. And this is a world map of social networks from December last year. And all the blue countries are countries where Facebook is the most popular social network. Um, China is red because the most popular social network is a, a Chinese company called QZone or QQ, uh, which is run by a company called Tencent. Um, but uh, you have a number of others, and you know those companies are held responsible for users' content, as I explained. Uh, in Russia, they do not block the internet, but at the moment, um, Russian companies are dominant, and those companies have a much closer and, let's say, porous relationship with the, with the government than than the government can have with Facebook, which kind of has a very interesting result politically as well. Um, and people are using Facebook to, in some places, challenge the sovereignty of their governments, in some places with some success. In other countries, governments, or shall we say politicians, are relying on Facebook to retain their own sovereignty. Right? If, you, if you look at some of the articles about the Obama campaign's re-election strategy, it relies very heavily on Facebook. So increasingly, you're seeing some governments actually, depending on Facebook, as kind of part of their politically, political legitimacy kind of structure, which is fascinating. Um, especially because, and I talk in my book about what I call the sovereigns of cyberspace, that uh, the decisions that these companies are making, these big internet global platforms are making, about how their uh, platform should be structured, what you can and cannot do, how your identity is manifested, how your information is collected, how it's shared, et cetera, they're not making these decisions based on what is best for your civil liberties um, or you know, what's going to enable you best to conduct your, to carry out your exercise, your political rights vis-a-vis -vis your government. They're all obviously making decisions based on what is commercially most advantageous to themselves. Um, but they are exercising, I mean, one can go too far with the analogy, you know, sovereignty in cyberspace is not the same as physical sovereignty of a physical nation state, but nonetheless, they are shaping what we can and cannot do in our digital lives, and they are having an effect on how our political lives then play out in, in the real world. And so the question is, to what extent can and should they be held accountable to the public interest? as we increasingly hold companies accountable for their environmental impact, for what they do, uh, how they treat their workers, uh, how they uh, treat people in the communities uh, in which they function, et cetera, et cetera. One example of, of some of the choices that, that get made by uh, companies, um, social media, and from, from this um, picture, you can kind of, so this sort of manifests um, how many people in Egypt felt social media played a very big role in bringing down Mubarak. But this page here, this Facebook page, known as the Khaled Saeed Facebook page, uh, was set up in the summer of 2010 after police brutally beat to death a young man named Khaled Saeed. And that page in, in the summer of 2010 became kind of a rallying cry or sort of a focal point for an anti-torture movement that had actually been going on for a long time. And a bunch of demonstrations got organized with increasing success throughout the summer and fall of 2010. But right on Thanksgiving Day here in the United States, that, that page went dark, which happened to be the day before a big Friday demonstration that was being organized in Cairo, because um, they always do their demonstrations on Friday because that's a day off uh, in, in the Islamic world. Um, it went dark, why? Because the people who had created the page were not using their real names. They were using pseudonyms. Why? Because they didn't want to turn out like this guy, brutally bludgeoned to death by the police. However, using a pseudonym is against the Facebook terms of service. Somebody brought to the attention of Facebook's administrators that these activists who created this page were not using their real names. And so the administrators took down their page. And it only got reinstated because the, 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 the people who created the page, who included Wael Gonim, who's a, a Google executive, had enough contacts in Silicon Valley and the human rights community that they were able to negotiate a solution with Facebook management to get administrative rights to the page handed over to another Egyptian person who lived in the, in the States who didn't mind using their real name. But this is an example, and I, I hear of numerous cases of activists using Facebook, not with their real name and different parts of the world because they're vulnerable, getting their accounts deactivated. Or sometimes they, they are using their real name, but they get reported for abuse of terms of service for different reasons and lose their accounts and lose their content. 
And so this is just kind of one example of, of the way in which the, the corporate interests sort of cr clash with the, the political rights of, of the most vulnerable users of these systems. Apple is another interesting case, you know, and, and an interesting case with kind of legitimacy as well. Um, when Steve Jobs died, actually people around the world were mourning his death, and you saw a lot of outpouring of sympathy uh, in the, the Farsi blogosphere, uh, which was fascinating. This was, a, this was a, a cartoon that was actually made by a exiled Iranian cartoonist uh, who's, it's, it's pretty obvious what, what the message is here. He's saying, an old man says to the angel of death, there are many dinosaurs in Iran and you go after red apples. And basically implying he had a lot more respect for Steve Jobs as a leader than he did for his own leaders. And, and that's really interesting. And you're, you're seeing this, I think, in a lot of countries where people actually, you know, the, the, the heads of these internet companies have more legitimacy with certain communities than leaders of actual nation states, um, which is fascinating. Uh, and, and has very interesting sort of political implications. And at the same time, Apple is censoring. They, they censor uh, their apps in China in accordance with Chinese government demands. But they're also making sort of arbitrary censorship decisions elsewhere. And so this is an example of a case in the United States where this political cartoonist, Mark Fiore, who went on to win a Pulitzer Prize, had his app rejected because some administrators at Apple thought that his political sarcasm was offensive. Um, although, if you look at the content, it's really, it's pretty standard stuff for a lot of political cartoons that you'd see in newspapers around the country. Um, very much constitutionally respected speech, but his app was not approved. And it, when his case got reported on, it turned out that there are a lot of political satirists who are not getting their apps approved by the App Store. Um, for reasons that, of course, Apple doesn't have to explain. And that you're also seeing apps kind of getting taken down and reinstated just based on lobbying by different interest groups of Apple, and, or just, again, based on arbitrary interpretations of the terms of service, but taking down speech that is very clearly First Amendment pr protected speech that is political or quasi-political in, in different ways. Um, and so again, and I talk about some of those cases in, in my book. Um, so which is again sort of an example of private companies, of course, legally they have every right to do this. You click the terms of service, I agree that you can, you know, take down my content or, you know, whatever. Um, but at the same time, what does this mean for the democratic discourse when increasingly we're reliant on these devices and platforms for our political lives? Um, so to, to kind of put it in another frame, um, so we, we have a situation where increasingly, you know, as citizens, our relationship with government is mediated uh, a great deal through these companies that, that run these platforms and services. In an ideal sort of democratic, kind of the ideal democratic setup, um, what happens? How do you hold companies accountable to public interest? Citizens vote for their government representatives. Then the government regulates the companies and makes sure that the companies adhere to the public interest, and then everybody should be happy. That's ideally how it's supposed to work, although uh, there are a number of ways in which it doesn't. One in that, that you know, companies are now people too, and, and so they get to sort of influence the, the, the outcomes of, of uh, 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 legislation and elections in increasingly powerful ways. Um, and also, at the same time, companies are shaping how we interact with our reality increasingly, including our political reality. Uh, so one of the things I talk about in my book is the question of how do we kind of as users of these technologies and really citizens of these platforms in a way um, lobby sort of or bargain with these sovereigns of cyberspace more effectively to get them to respect our rights and interests. Um, and that we need to do kind of more thinking about how that can be done. And then, of course, you have the issue of companies, you know, based in the United States, thinking about their business in an American context, having an impact on users all around the world whose political and cultural and social context they might not be able to imagine particularly and not really understand how things are going to play out. And then, of course, you have 
issues with governments passing a law, you know, so if Congress passes, were to have passed SOPA, that would have affected internet companies and platforms, you know, all around the world and affected internet users all around the world, most of whom who did not vote for the US Congress. So those people all around the world having absolutely no way of holding these lawmakers accountable. Um, so you have sort of a mismatch of the way in which power is exercised and the way in which you can hold it accountable to the public interest, and which is why I kind of, again, raise the question of, do we need better ways of global users of these platforms taking their concerns to companies since they can't really count on the governments, the sovereign nation states, to care about anybody other than the people who, who actually keep them in office? Um, and what do we do about that? Um, so after having shown a really elaborate graphic, I'm going to show a funny video and, and then wrap up. But uh, I think this video uh, kind of helps to underscore the, the point I'm trying to make. Thirds majority in the case of Mumbai. Be quiet. I order you to be quiet. Order? Who does he think he is? <laughs> I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. Well, how do you become king then? The lady of the lake, her arm clad in the purest shimmering samite, held aloft Excalibur from the bosom of the water, signifying by divine providence that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur. That is why I'm your king. Listen, strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Be quiet. Oh, but you can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you. Shut up. I love this. I love this movie, and I love this particular part of it. And I'm just so thrilled that I can use it to illustrate a point in my book. Um, but what's so funny about this is it's mashing up two completely different ways of thinking about power and sovereignty, right? So you have the divine right of kings on the one hand, uh, which is basically how power was exercised and or organized everywhere in the world, uh, you know, at, at, at one point. Um, and we evolved from the divine right of the sovereign, <laughs> be it a king or a, an emperor or a sultan or whatever, uh, increasingly uh, globally to the notion of consent of the governed and that the legitimacy of a, of a government power derives from whether it is governing by consent of the people. And even in countries that are not technically considered democratic, you, you see these regimes going through great lengths to, to prove that they have the consent of, of their people um, to govern. And But what I argue in my book is that we've sort of we've sort of hit another moment where consent of the government based on the nation state is failing to solve all of these problems I outlined earlier in my talk with kind of how, you know, it, assuming that the point of governance based on consent, and we put aside this whole issue of, you know, there's a lot of theoretical issues around consent, but assuming that the basic point is to constrain it to enable power to be exercised for the greater good of the community, but also be able to constrain that power so that when it's abused, someone is held accountable and can be replaced, potentially. That's sort of the whole point. Um, that's not working so well for us now in a globally interconnected world. And so the question being, how do we move from consent of the governed based on nation state more to consent of the networked? How do we ensure that the exercise of power over everyone on the network is held accountable, that, it's, that we have some way of ensuring that it's working in, in the interests of everyone on the network rather than just in the interests of you know, Facebook or the interests of a particular government that happens to have legislative power over a large number of internet companies, uh, et cetera. Just how, how do we create a more accountable system? Um, I talk in, in part of the book about the digital commons, and I know Professor, Professor Boyle has written a lot about that and, and so on, but just the, the importance of having uh, a robust digital commons that is, that is not based on proprietary standards, not necessarily based on proprietary content so that people, uh, it, again, um, the, the health of the global network, the ability of people to use the network in a manner that advocates for rights um, that advocates for, for goals that go beyond the economic 
um, having a robust digital commons is absolutely vital and, and thinking about how we ensure that the global system nurtures and protects and enables the growth of that commons rather than kind of killing it off with various legislation and trade agreements and whatnot is, is also very important from a civil liberties standpoint in the internet age. And I try to make that argument in the book. I don't have time to kind of go into the whole thing here. And just, just wrapping up a final point, I like to quote a, um, a professor at the University of Austin, Texas named uh, Rosenthal Alves, um, who likes to describe governance in the pre-internet age as, a, as based on an inf information desert. It was entirely, we had an economy and governance system of, that assumed information scarcity um, and difficulty of moving that information around or sharing it and so on. And then suddenly, of course, the rain came and we have a rainforest and all kinds of new organisms and things uh, that nobody recognizes or understands. And we need to figure out how to build a civilization in this rainforest and systems of governance in this rainforest that really work for everyone um, and, and ensure that the rights of all of the members of this civilization have, have a good shot at being respected and protected. And I'm not arguing for free for all. I'm not arguing for a state of nature on the internet. I actually do think there's a role for governance, but it needs to be governance that is rooted in consent of the governed, the governed being everyone in the rainforest, not just the remnants that got brought over from the desert. Um, and how do we do that? And we are very, very far from figuring it out. So in the book, I'm not proposing Rebecca McKinnon's proposed solution to fix the entire world. Um, I'm kind of diagnosing a lot of the problems and pointing towards a number of things that lots of different groups are doing to try and start working on solutions. And um, there's not enough time to, to go into all of that, but I recommend you read the book, and, and I know that some people in the room have been, been involved with trying to think about some of those solutions. So with that, I will stop and look, look forward to hearing what Professor Boyle has to say. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Thanks to Lilia and to Emma and the others for putting this on. Um, this is, um, let me start by recommending the book wholeheartedly. Um, um, I don't get any of the royalties from it and I still think you should read it, so uh, I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating, beautifully written, and it will give you a lot to think about, a lot of um, the kinds of facts and anecdotes and situations that make you question your own assumptions. Um, I was trying to figure out what I could do to you know, add context to what Rebecca was saying, and it seemed to me that maybe one of the things I could do is offer a little bit of a, a brief history of like how we got where we are and how we have tried and in some cases failed to understand this whole world of internet politics. Um, and I want to start by framing two particular problems that we have, which I think run all the way through Rebecca's book and run through internet politics. The first is that we're just very un bad at understanding the internet and the specific form that, that made it um, global, namely the World Wide Web, which remember is only 20 years old. It's younger than you, okay? Right? It's younger than the people in this room. It can't drink legally in the United States. The World Wide Web was effectively invented in 1992. The internet dates from decades before that, but the World Wide Web from 1992. And we're still very bad at understanding it. And the reason, we're, there are a couple of reasons that are very important, we're very bad at understanding it. One of them is that we're extremely bad at understanding open systems. That our intuitions about open systems are just constantly and perversely tilted uh, in one direction which makes us misunderstand them. So uh, there are many examples of this. Those of you who've been in my classes have heard some of them. If I said to you, um, 10 or 15 years ago, how do you create the greatest encyclopedia the world has ever seen? Um, and said, I have a plan. My plan is we'll have a web page and people will like put stuff up. <laughs> that wouldn't seem like the kind of thing that any of you, I mean, it doesn't make, think of what you know about property theory, about you know, what you learn in your MBA, about organizational theory. That makes no sense at all. Qu quite seriously, right? I mean, you would say, nice man, we have a padded room for you. you know, here's a nice jacket, right? Um, if I said to you, we'll have a worldwide network that anyone can connect to and they can effectively, in many places in the world, say anything, will that work, I think, as of, um, this you would have been in daycare, I guess, as of 1994, 1995, you would have said, no, that could never work. This was what the Clinton administration thought. I mean, there will be morons on the net, check. 
There will be pirates, check. There will be porn, check, check, check. There will be piracy, check, 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 check. There will be strangely articulate sons of Nigerian oil ministers with fabulous offers to you, check, 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 check. <laughs> and let's face it, most of the people on the internet are saying things that are wrong, particularly if you ever read the comments to any sports feed or politics feed, right? <laughs> and yet you use it as a source of information every day. How can that be? I mean, it's probable, it seems to me, that most of the, quote, facts on the internet are false, right? How could we possibly build a functioning system out of it? Well, it turns out that openness does allow all of those things, and we predicted them brilliantly. But it turns out that open systems also allow for their own curation. Google doesn't rely on how the words in the page. It relies on the links you make to the page. Sort of like citation would make a law review editor very happy. It's actually a peer-reviewed system, and we're the peers, and thus, out of crap, nonsense, and ranting, is assembled truth that is usable. We wouldn't have predicted that, right? And we continue to fail to understand it. So when we go to regulate the internet, we do so with a set of predispositions which incline us to believe that closed systems work brilliantly and open systems are a disaster. And while some open systems are a disaster, our bias, not error, error means it's completely wrong all the time, it's just a bias, predisposes us to make uh, serious mistakes. That's a, a first problem. Let me give you a lightning summary of sort of the history of excited, burbling political theory about the net and then finish with a, a sort of where that leads uh, us in terms of Rebecca's book. At the birth of the World Wide Web, a lot of um, libertarians, cyber libertarians, were very excited because they basically thought that finally the thing that was going to kill the state had arrived. Um, or at least, if not kill the state, then geld it, then remove its most effective power. Why? Uh, some scholars refer to it as the libertarian gotcha. You are going to need this system of communication but it's a tap that is either off or on. You can't control it the way you can. So went the thinking as of 1993, 1994. You can't control it the way you can your single landline or your state-controlled radio or TV because, in fact, it's technically true, the internet treats censorship as a malfunction and roots around it. That's the nature of a decentralized system. It's very hard to filter. Were we right about that? not entirely see the Great Firewall of China, which Rebecca showed you up there. It turns out that many of the technologies that can be used to enable the internet can also be used to control the internet. A flip of the point that I just made to you a moment ago, namely that openness can allow us to solve the problems of openness. Well, it turns out that many of the technologies of openness can also be used to exercise control. A lovely little paradox if it were not for the fact that a lot of people's civil liberties around the world actually depend on the way that paradox plays out. So the sort of libertarian gotcha idea proved to be inaccurate in a couple of ways. One of them was the notion that the technology was immutable. This is something that Larry Lessig, I, and others were writing about back in the, the early 90s. It's like you think that the internet is this thing called the internet, and there's this natural and inexorable progress towards human freedom. Not so. The thing you call the internet depends on a series of assumptions, technical rules, technologies, and protocols, all of which are subject to change and have, in fact, changed during your lives. For example, we assume that we're connecting to the internet through a general purpose computing device that would make Alan Turing happy, not through a terminal with only a limited number of functions. It's because it's a general purpose computer, you can program it to do anything, that you can program it to do anything, that you can make the internet, the wires, do things we could never have imagined, right? But that's not inexorable. <laughs> Initiatives such as so-called trusted computing actually aim to make that box a little more manageable and pay, oh, you shouldn't be using this. Are you authorized to use this content? Can you prove? Is this the digital rights management up to date? Are you in the right place? Does your IP6 designation show that you're entitled to use this? That is not inexorably open. The framework of the internet was presumed to be an open one. You've all used multiple um, messaging and social systems on the internet, and they've changed during your lifetimes. Remember AIM? Remember those instant messages all through? I'm getting up to, what, like middle school now, right? You're in eagerly messaging, and that would never go away, right? Remember MySpace? Why? Um, <laughs> so why have those things changed? 
those things have changed because this was an open platform that anyone could innovate on top of, and if they innovated and produced something better, you, fickle creatures that you are, would switch. Right? That's the presumption of the internet, and that was the great hope about how it wouldn't have incumbents. Okay, now the second thing that we get wrong about the internet, and this is something that Rebecca's book is very good about. We focus a great deal on state power rather than private power. In constitutional law, we're actually required to do so through the state action doctrine. In liberal political theory, we have very different theories about the norms that restrain the state and the norms that restrain private power. There are lots of differences there. If we were going to talk about what they are, it would take the entire uh, time we have. But here's one. One is that it's assumed that private parties don't have the kind of power over you that the state does. In particular, that you have easy power of exit, which you may not have from your state. It may not be easy to just up stakes and say, fine, I don't like this country. I'm moving somewhere else. The costs are very high to doing that, right? Exit is a powerful strategy, just as voice is. Exit depends on your ability actually to leave, that you're not locked in. Now, it is possible to have exit, but there's this thing in, in information economics called network effects. Network effects are the golden handcuffs that, that bind you to the standards of the time. Why are almost all of you using Word? Because everybody else is using Word. Now, maybe there's a better word processing system, but how on earth would you change? Because if people are saying, what a weird document. Now, some of you are using OpenOffice and NeoOffice, but even you every day have to deal, what's this weird thing? What's ODT? And why does it say that? And I certainly can't play this OG stuff on my computer. And you probably don't even know what .org is because that's an open uh, uh, audio file protocol. So the ease of switching depends on something absolutely vital. It's called interoperability. It's the ability of you to take those 5,000 word essays, documents, letters, and resumes you have and move them to something else. To take all of that information that you have accumulated within Facebook and migrate it somewhere else. To take all the information that Google has about you and move somewhere else. As Rebecca notes very importantly in her book, companies have markedly different uh, rules about whether or not that is possible, whether or not it's transparent, or whether or not you even know what is happening. So this kind of lock-in effect produces a pattern that we're not as familiar with in private when dealing with private companies. If I eat an apple, it doesn't stop you from eating a pear. Right? My consumption decisions are independent of yours. If I want to drink Snapple, you can still drink Sprite. But in a world where it's not like apples and pears, it's like language. If I say, let's all speak Esperanto, it's not going to go anywhere because there are strong lock-in effects to English. Private parties can have powers akin to the lock-in effects of language. And that's why the issue that Rebecca raises is so important, which is now we're dealing with companies that control networks of meaning. There is a biblical parable about what happens when everyone tries to shift from a dominant network. It's called the Tower of Babel. No one can communicate with anyone else. So what's the solution? As Rebecca noted, solutions are hard to come by. The first thing, I think, is to understand that this technology is not immutable and that it is constantly changing and being subject to attack. For a long time, those of us who work in this field have wondered if there would ever be a citizen's mu movement for cyberspace, not on cyberspace, for cyberspace. A citizen's movement that would aim to protect that open space, that platform that allows democratic speech, that allows the rise and fall of dominant standards that allows communication, that allows the kid who's growing up in rural North Carolina as a lesbian actually to say, wow, there are other people like me and it's okay, right? That's sort of important. It's a technology that we um, should care about deeply. Are you engaged in working for that? Or are you simply looking at your shiny digital rights management encrusted uh, toy which you recently received from Apple? Are you actually dealing with an open platform or are you dealing one with one that is profoundly controlled at every aspect. Are the technologies that you actually adopt the ones that contain the freedoms that Rebecca is describing? And are the patterns that you're using, I mean, how could you move from Facebook? Ones which will make it impossible 
to tell your children that once there was a thing called AIM and a thing called MySpace, and I shifted to Facebook, because how could one ever shift from Facebook? The fear, I think, that people like Rebecca and I have is that the freedom that the internet gave to people, to companies, to innovation, to culture, to free speech is one that can be taken away as easily as it was granted. It was granted by accident, and it very nearly didn't happen. For example, it was very nearly the case that every internet service provider in the world was going to be strictly liable for every act of copyright infringement carried out over its networks, which would mean that your internet would look absolutely nothing like the world you have. You're welcome. <laughs> this could have happened, and it is happening. It is not a trivial point. And for those who care about human rights, and that is the purpose of our discussion today, this is both the greatest force for communication and outreach and civil society that we've had, and at the same time, a reed far too weak to bear that burden, something which we can't rely on, something which can't replace actual democratic engagement, and something which can be profoundly changed. The challenge of Rebecca's book, and also your political future, is how not to be complacent about all of that. Thank you. We can open it up to questions now, if uh, folks have questions, um, either uh, for Rebecca or the professor uh, about the book. Um, well, I have one to start off. Um, I was wondering if, if either of you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the, the movement of activism that we saw around SOPA. Um, and I think probably a number of us here, we saw on people's Facebook feeds um, posts about SOPA, and it seemed like people were really engaged and really um, motivated to, to act around that legislation. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why you think that was and sort of what that um, portends in the future for other types of legislation that, that are trying to do similar things. Sure. Um, I guess I'll start. Um, I mean, the, the activism around SOPA, I, I think, really was delightfully surprising to a lot of us who were kind of I mean, so, some of us have been writing about these issues and, and these various bills for a long time and just sort of banging our heads against the wall and wishing that somebody other than the usual suspects would care. And then suddenly, everybody started to care and people were calling their senators and congressmen and congresspeople and, and, uh, and you know, getting mobilized. And I, I think it had to do with a number of things. Part of it was that a lot of groups got together and actually coordinated strategy um, clearly, the industry, uh, the internet companies were very much against SOPA. They felt, felt that it was really going to hurt their business, so they put a lot of effort behind opposing it as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I think it, it was a very hopeful moment in that it, it really showed that there's a generation of people who really do care about their ability to use the internet, about whether the internet remains what it is today, whether or not people are going to be able to continue using it as they do. Um, so that was, I think, really encouraging and that people are willing to get politically active about it. It's not clear to me whether that's going to translate on other issues related to civil liberties on the internet. So we, we have several, basically in the House and Senate, two bills each on cybersecurity that civil liberties groups are absolutely you know, as appalled as they are over SOPA for many of the same reasons, concern about lack of transparency and abuse and, and, and so on. Um, and the same mobilization has yet to happen. Industry is staying silent on it. I do not think we're going to hear industry, see industry, any part of industry mobilizing on this issue, particularly we're on our own this time. And it's not clear to me whether lacking that leg up, we're going to do it. Um, so, and perhaps, I mean, surveillance is also a, a more difficult issue in that a lot of people don't feel, oh, you know, if surveillance is happening, it's not actually going to change my ability to do whatever it do I normally do. And, you know, as long as I'm not doing anything bad, then I don't have to worry kind of attitude. Um, and uh, so it's just harder to get people to care because they don't see how it's going to affect them immediately, necessarily, un unless they're 
a member of a group that is particularly worried about surveillance, which in any society is a minority of people generally, which is part of the problem. And so how I think it's a critical question now. We're, one of these bills is going to go into market probably at the end of the end of the month. Um, if, if the SOPA movement, if the anti-SOPA movement was anything other than a one-off, it's, it's time to figure that out now um, because otherwise it, it might just be a one-off. So, I, I just add a few things. Um, the, the thing about SOPA, I think there are a couple of things that are very related to the industry groups that came out against it. If Google and, Google and Wikipedia, I got a, a text from my son. Google and Wikipedia say that the internet is about to be censored. Why haven't you done something about it? <laughs> um, which uh, betrays a trusting, uh, a great <laughs> trust in me, which I, I'm not um, capable, of, capable of living up to. Um, that, I think, was, for a lot of people, a wake-up call, although I should note parenthetically, uh, something I've not said publicly before, that I think the Google information page on SOPA was perhaps the worst design page I've ever seen created by Google for anything in mm. Just astounding. It made buzz privacy settings seem excellent. Um, uh, however, I think there was a lot that didn't have to do with Google and Facebook. Um, there were a lot of people who watched the hearings mm. on SOPA and PIPA, and it was hard. I mean, it really was hard. You have all these people who are sitting there going, well, let me boast about how I don't understand the technology I'm about to regulate. So, I mean, just imagine this. You're about to get an appendectomy. The doctor's going, I actually don't know much about anatomy, but I've seen a lot of cooking shows. <laughs> hey, no, right? You, you wouldn't like this. Or, you know, you had the, you know, the, uh, the equivalent of, like, Linus Pauling sending in, you know, an important message to a government that's about to regulate vaccines, saying you're about to screw everything up, mm. uh, i.e. the people who created many of the, the, the domain name system actually saying you're about to break it. And people are like, who are these people? They're just geeks, ha, ha, ha. It's like, no, they're the people who understand the technology and you're boasting about not being one. And I think for a lot of people, including those, to be honest, who only understanding about DNS is that they don't have it when they can't connect to the internet, um, a lot of people who nevertheless saw, even if I know, I know enough to think that the way we're legislating about this is broken. And it basically was like listening to your grandfather boast about not being able to program his VCR. And it's just sort of like, no. This is actually not good. I think that was a generational um, moment that was quite important. Um, the second thing I think is the, um, the fact that people have experience of using types of sites which they could see would be struck at was very important. So that this sort of this hysteria about piracy. Um, someone pointed out, for example, that one of the biggest supporters of the bill, one and one online, who actually supply my uh, domain name. Or, or, or my host for, for my domain system, that they were clearly in violation of these bills because if you tried to buy, you know, Vuitton.com, they would say these aren't available, but Vuitton.biz is, you know, so, and, you know, the kind of thing which clearly would have triggered some of the provisions in um, some of these bills. The third thing, and I'll finish on this, which is um, what's remarkable is, and here this is something that the Obama administration has really been just dreadful about. I mean, truly awful. This is an administration that came into power of pledging transparency. Um, and that was one of the most important claims that they made. Um, they have been so far from transparent on these issues um, that it's just truly shocking. And the, the most shocking one, you should, you know, Google Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an agreement being negotiated on your behalf by United States diplomats, which you are forbidden from seeing. Right? You may not see it because it has been classified, right? Because this deals with things like counterfeiting, you know? Step away from the bag, man. It's got a Louis Vuitton symbol on it. <laughs> this complete absence of transparency, and there are lots of truly vile things in the, the uh, drafts of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement as there were in the initial um, act of anti-counterfeiting agreement, just show how far from a transparent process and democratic process we've got. And so, SOPA protest was incredibly exciting, but there's also an enormously long way to go. Mm -hmm. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.